Doki Doki Literature Club is a story of loneliness. It's a story of social anxiety, social isolation, and the existential horror inherent in losing everyone around you to your very worst self. The dark places that can take you, and what happens when you give in to that worst self of yours in a desperate bid not to remain alone. This ought to have been the thesis of my original video on Doki Doki Literature Club, which released a little over two years ago. Instead, my thesis was that everyone else was wrong about Doki Doki Literature Club, and I was right. That video is bad and wrong. This video will hopefully be much better. I've been intending to remake the DDLC video for quite a while, and I probably would have procrastinated on that particular task indefinitely had it not so happened that the sudden release of the game's remaster fell on a day when I was feeling perhaps the most I'd ever felt like DDLC in my entire life. And so, after playing through DDLC Plus for about 20 hours, Hours, and then continuing to feel depressed for about a month, I started writing this video. Today, I want to discuss how and why Doki Doki Literature Club resonated with me, how I feel the new content added to Plus gives the story more weight, and why I think that still matters. Content warning, as always, for suicidal and violent imagery, as well as some discussion associated with some potentially triggering topics, so... Yeah, let's go. I imagine most won't need a recap of Doki Doki Literature Club, given the notoriety of the game and its associated memes. Nevertheless, here's the basics. A player named Typical Nothing Harem Protagonist, who goes to a nebulously Japanese high school, is goaded into joining a literature club by his childhood friend, Sayori. The literature club, like many such clubs in relaxed slice-of-life anime, has no serious ambitions and is mostly a friend hangout spot, operating under the pretense of extracurricular activity. Every day, the club members share poems with one another, while the protagonist tries to seduce the girls by writing poems that happen to use words they like. As the story progresses, the girls reveal more and more about their favorite styles of literature and their unique quirks and insecurities. As is now very common knowledge, DDLC is not at all how it appears. It's only a dating sim in the loosest sense of the word, and is actually a fourth wall breaking psychological horror visual novel with a Lovecraftian bent. This is blatantly foreshadowed, especially if you go into the game knowing of its transgressive nature beforehand, but for that transgression to work, there must be something to transgress, and to that end, DDLC commits to the dating sim bit for some time before pulling back the curtain. The four girls are each emotionally troubled, and the game subtly and carefully foreshadows each of their troubles through their dialogue, their poems, and their interactions with the protagonist and with one another. Sayori is experiencing suicidal depression and wears a cheerful smile to keep her negative feelings from affecting those around her, while also feeling guilty for continuing to be alive and being a burden on others. Natsuki loves cutesy girls manga and cute girly things and wants to express that, but also feels deeply insecure, as she is often made to feel unwelcome elsewhere for having such supposedly childish interests. Yuri lights right up whenever given the chance to discuss her special interests of eloquent poetry 
poetry and exquisitely detailed novels, but is otherwise shy, reserved, and exceptionally poor at making small talk. And last but not least, we have Monica, the club president. Well, she is most of the time gentle, patient, polite, and empathetic. She is also a deeply anxious and self-absorbed, insecure person. Also, she has experienced an epiphany, as she has been granted admin privileges for the simulation in which the girls all live, leading her to suicidal depression! Each of these characters have something in common with me, as I share traits and flaws with basically all of them, dedication to my special interests, trying to act cheerful to hide my flaws and lift the spirits of others, the insecurity about expressing myself, and of course, the suicidal depression. <laughs> The writing of Act 1 is, in my opinion, pretty good. The dialogue of the girls feels earnest and realistic to me, reminiscent of my own experiences talking with other nerdy people about why we like the things we like and trying to sort through our differences. It's fairly nostalgic, even. The amount of passion the girls dedicate to their interests, and the hills they choose to die on, especially the hills Natsuki and Yuri choose to die on, it's all quite relatable to me, as I, too, get easily defensive about my interests and die on some weird hills. All of this character, however, is deliberately undercut by the narration of the protagonist, whose myopic focus on the cuteness of the girls, and minimal interest in literature, draw attention away from all that. The girls' acceptance of him, and their immediate willingness to accept his romantic advances, only goes to show that they are just as lonely only as he is. As a friendless otaku with no social life to speak of, his bar for acceptable romantic partners is quite low, and as each of these four girls all feel socially isolated from their peers for one reason or another, their bar is surely quite low as well. Joyce, please just tell me you like my poems. I don't care if you hate them, just tell me I'm the best. I just... Uh, I really just need to hear that from someone. They are willing, ready, eager to spill their hearts to and go out with the first person who shows them kindness, because they are the loneliest girls in their world, and they will do anything to not be lonely. Not least Monica, and not least Sayori. What? This? What is this? Oh no. No. This can't be it. This can't be all there is. What is this? What am I? Make it stop! Please make it stop! One thing I got wrong about Monica in my earlier video is the idea that she would have lacked character flaws if not for her epiphany. The side stories clearly contradict this notion. She was never perfect, she just felt a need to appear perfect so as not to disappoint others. Her response to her epiphany is defined by her personality, not the definition of her personality. Sayori's response to this same epiphany is also defined by her personality. She was already depressed and suicidal, and only hung on to her life on the promise of things getting better, and when she realizes she lives in a simulation, her response is to assume that nothing will get better, nothing will change, because her world begins and ends here. Because she wasn't real, she was barely alive to begin with. But Monica, at least in this version of their reality, chooses something else. She refuses to believe that she's not real, chooses to believe that she is the real one, the one out of place in this world, and that she must escape. <laughs> ah, sometimes. I feel like you and I are the only real people here. You know what I mean? But 
This is a mistake. Monica is struggling, the same as Sayori, the same as all of the girls, in fact. She is, just as they all are, afraid of being lonely. And she is most acutely aware of that, because while she has the other three girls, she is alone in the pain of her epiphany. And so she lies to herself, convinces herself that she's above this pain, that it's a blessing in disguise, that this pain makes her real. But in so doing, Monica becomes detached from, ignorance of, the pain felt by her friends. And it's this pain, the pain of the loneliness inherent to living in this sealed, inescapable reality, that defines the game's second act, defines its cosmic horror. The lonely heart of Doki Doki Literature Club. Act 2 is immediately effective at creating a thematically appropriate feeling of isolation within the game as you soon start to feel trapped with these characters. As the worst possible thing happens to the literature club, they push each other away and it becomes yet another place they are all strange and unwelcome in, unable to get along, and desperate to not be alone they become their worst selves. Yuri becomes possessive to the extreme, stalking the protagonist, invading his personal space, and demanding his attention at every possible turn, reflecting the person she is afraid of appearing as, afraid of being to others. Her fear of coming on too strong and scaring people away by being too pushy and imposing, or by people finding out about her knife fetish and cutting habit. As Yuri commands more and more of your time, pulling you aside to read with her, regardless of whether you wrote your poem for her or not, Natsuki begins to feel more and more lonely. The literature club wants a place of sanctuary for her to express her cute side and and share the manga she loves becomes unrecognizable and suffocating. It's revealed that not only is she shunned by her other friend groups, but that she is also abused and beaten by her father for expressing herself. She, feeling jealous of Yuri, aggressively demands more of your attention as well. And Monica, all throughout, remains gentle, patient, and empathetic, but her demeanor starkly contrasts with the increasingly chaotic and toxic atmosphere of the club, belying her sinister intentions as she encourages you to shun both Yuri and Natsuki and only spend time with her. She is clearly just as afraid of being left alone as Yuri and Natsuki are, and she, too, is giving in to her worst possible self. Monica is unable to accept an outcome in which things don't go her way, and though her coercing is more gentle than Yuri's, it is equally imposing and equally toxic, just more subtly so. After Yuri, overcome with emotion, guts herself and falls dead, Natsuki unceremoniously pukes and flees the club room. Monica is left alone with the player, seeming to have even surprised herself with the consequences of her own actions. She's super apologetic about all of it, but then she kills her friends, and the world ends again. Before we move on to Act 3, it's finally time to visit DDLC Plus's most distinctive new feature, the desktop. 
Unless you're launching the game for the first time, in which case you'll be greeted with the hotly anticipated, not suitable for children or those who are easily disturbed, the enigmatic logo for Metaverse Enterprise Solutions will appear, a boot sequence will initiate, and you'll be prompted to log in to an in-game desktop through which you will then access the game. There are file folders in which secrets are hidden, an email app at which you'll receive emails, a gallery app in which you'll find unlockable art and bonus content, and a music player which can be used to listen to the soundtrack in-game. This serves several purposes, the first and most obvious of which is that it allows the game's file hunting aspects to be seamlessly ported to consoles. This does remove the added verisimilitude in discovering the character files in your real-life computer's file folders outside of the game itself, but Monica no longer has to awkwardly inform you, FYI, there are folders! Go to Steam and click Browse Local Files. Taken all together, I think this choice ultimately adds more than it takes away. It also gives players a good place to take a break from the game without actually leaving the game, which feels good. It feels good to have a space in the game to get away from all the heavier stuff, to be able to browse the folders, change the wallpaper, listen to music, etc. It's just nice. But the desktop is also part of the story. It has environmental storytelling in it. Slowly, it trip feeds you information about Metaverse Enterprise and the true nature of the game. Doki Doki Literature Club is, in fact, an experimental small small-scale simulated universe, and the four girls of the literature club are AI programs that the metaverse engineers have created to gather data about the emotional response they have to living in a simulation. And I realize for some this'll seem trite or ridiculous, or like it only exists for MatPat to make videos about, but personally, I think this is actually genius in a way, because with this addition, Doki Doki Literature Club is no longer this super meta story about visual novel characters suffering because they live in a visual novel. It's a kinda sorta sci-fi story about AI anime girls suffering because of capitalism. And yeah, I know, so original. Lots of totally original stories out there about amoral corporations making AI for profits that turn out sad and want more than the lot they've been given in existence. But I really do think this is the best change. It means, among other things, that the theme of small-scale cosmic horror is much more obviously present in the text, and that I have much more content to analyze. Speaking of which, it's also revealed that, as a control sample, the engineers created a second simulation in which Monica was not made aware of her ability to affect the world, and and also that they live in a simulation, a fork of the game's main universe, what they call VM1, to create the universe in which the game's side stories are set. And those side stories are the game's second stroke of genius, while the virtual desktop and the hidden files help cement DLC's cosmic horror within its text, the side stories effectively complement the main story by more deeply exploring the social woes of the characters that are at the heart of DLC's narrative. Um, wait, how did I... Sorry, I just had a really weird deja vu. This hasn't happened before or anything, right? My head has been a little fussy lately. I hope it hasn't really been showing or anything. I would hate for you to think I'm weird just after we started spending time together. Everyone has a few unusual things about them. But expressing those things so soon after meeting someone is usually seen as inappropriate or unlikable. At least that's what I've discovered. When I was a bit younger, I think it would come on really strongly and get a little too intense. It made people not want to be around me. So I started hating those things about myself. 
my obsession with certain hobbies and the way I can control myself when I get too excited about something, so I eventually stop trying to talk to people. If nobody could ever like me for the things that matter most to me, then it's just easier if I close myself off. But recently something's been wrong. I don't know what it is. But every time we come to the club, my heart starts to go crazy. Like it's going to rip out of my chest. It overwhelms me with energy and emotions that I can't let out. It's been making me do weird things. I don't know why it's happening. Joyce? Is it just me? Or has Monica been acting a little off lately? She's always been a sweetheart ever since I joined the club. But recently I've been feeling something sharp whenever she's around. I'm not crazy, right? Please tell me I'm not. I couldn't say anything before because she's always listening. But finally we're alone. Can we just stay here for a while? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to stay here. Just the two of us. We can stay here until the club ends, and then we'll have the club room all to ourselves. Nobody to interfere with our reading time. Nobody to make me feel like stabbing myself in the throat. <laughs> that, that was a joke, just a joke. I do like knives though. It sounds strange, but you wouldn't understand if you've never seen how beautiful they can be. I have an idea. Why don't you come to my house sometime? I can show you my collection. I've gotten them all from various artisans. I make sure to give them all their fair share of use. I don't want them to get lonely or anything. Nobody deserves to be lonely. Nobody. <laughs> and, and that's why I'm so happy that you joined the literature club, Joyce. Now we don't have to be lonely anymore. Because we have each other. Every day. That's all we need. You know what? Let's quit the literature club. There's no need for us to be around Monica's slimy tongue anymore. Not to mention that other pathetic child. We can walk home together every day after school. And read together. Eat together. Sleep together. Doesn't that sound perfect? It's everything we could ever want. Isn't that why I joined the club in the first place? It's almost like it was fate. Fate that we would meet each other. And now we get the happy ending that I've patiently waited years for. Will you do that with me, Joyce? Will, will you? The side stories of Doki Doki Literature Club Plus are six and a half vignettes, which are slowly unlocked as you play the main game and witness each character's exclusive scenes. They take alternate, less existentially terrified versions of these girls and put them into the literature club room without the protagonist to get into a disaster lesbian fuck puddle. Uh, I mean, make friends with each other. The game insists they are stories of friendship. Ship. The end credits song is called Stories of Friendship and Literature, as opposed to the other song, the one that sounds kinda similar, that's called Dreams of Love and Literature song. Just to make it super clear, they are not lesbians. No, Natsuki did not just ask Yuri out on a date. They are just friends. No gays, totally no wordlessly. And without a smile, Sayori rests her forehead on Monica's shoulder. Through their contact, Monica can almost feel the torrent of thoughts swimming in Sayori's head. And in this moment, enchanted by the fire of the club, Monica realizes that of all the days that have passed, this is the one where she really, really hopes no one walks through the door. <laughs> You're like, the sweetest sweet girl I've ever met. No lesbians, just queer baiting, ship teasing, whatever. I mean, Salvato had to know what he was doing here, 
So... Nevertheless, the side stories are all very sweet and good. Very good, in fact. So much so, that it's almost shocking how good they are. The writing is excellent, even better than the original game, in fact, as the characters here are so much better and more gently written, their interactions so warm and touching. It's clear Salvato has improved since writing the original DDLC, although perhaps that's at least partly because he he wasn't handicapping himself, trying to make the dialogue sound like poorly translated trash this time. And the new music, composed primarily by Nikki Kylar, is kind of insane. The instrumentation of these new tracks is so much more deep and rich than the music of the main game that it's honestly jarring going between the side stories and the main story just because of that. But what's really good about the side stories in addition to the fact that there's now this pile of lesbian polycule subtext in the DDLC remaster, is that there is now more explicit context for the fears we saw manifest during Act 2. In each of them, the girls' issues are explored in more detail and summarily resolved as they talk about their feelings, their insecurities, their anxieties. In the first side story, Sayori is the first member to join Monica's new literature club, and when she does, is at first bright and cheerful. But not long after, Monica discovers a depressing poem written by Sayori and confronts her. Sayori is at first unwilling to open up very much, but later vents out her feelings and ends up crying on Monica's shoulders, wailing about how sad she is, how much she hates herself for making Monica put up with her, and I relate to this a lot. The feeling of wanting to open up and be honest about your feelings, but always feeling a need to hide them so as not to rock the boat, and then ending up spilling your entire soul to the first person who shows you kindness, who seems like they won't get scared or treat you differently for opening up. The second side story explores Yuri's reasons behind her shyness. She finds it difficult to talk about anything besides her special interests, and to make friends with others who don't share those interests. She is afraid of making people uncomfortable or indifferent with how often she talks about her favorite novels, how difficult she finds it to talk about much else. Her anxiety makes it difficult for her to communicate effectively with others, especially in groups, and her inability to pick up on subtle social cues makes her often assume the worst possible outcome in even the most remotely ambiguous of situations. Thus, she often avoids conventional social functions, instead seeking out like-minded individuals online or else immersing herself in her books. And this, too, is deeply relatable to me. Earlier this year, I tried to show my favorite game, Psychonauts, to my then-girlfriends. Psychonauts is just about my favorite favorite game of all time, and I can easily talk about it for quite a long time, and it is inevitable that I will, of course, sometime on this channel. Psychonauts is something that I find it easy to connect with people on, and easy to share with others. So I was somewhat disheartened when, when I turned on the game and played it in front of my girlfriends, they appeared barely interested. Now. There was a perfectly sensible reason why this was the case. We were kind of busy, since we were going to be traveling in the morning, and they were packing, and really, I ought to have been packing too, but I still bring this up because it's a recent example of how sensitive I tend to get about the things I love, especially when I'm earnestly trying to share it with others, and they don't seem to care. Even though there was a perfectly rational reasoning behind it, which I was fully aware of, I was still a little disappointed, and a part of me was still thinking, maybe they hate it, maybe I'm being annoying right now, and they just don't want to tell me. A feeling which Yuri exhibits and acts on in this side story as she tries to get Sayori invested in her novels, but quickly assumes that because Sayori isn't quite as eager as she is, that she hates them. So yeah, I relate to this quite a lot. If someone outright tells me, 
that they don't like Psychonauts, or that they think it's a bad or stupid or gross or boring game or whatever, it's very likely I'll get defensive, exactly what Natsuki does when she joins the Literature Club and is almost immediately belittled for trying to introduce her special interest of manga to the group. This leads to two separate confrontations with Monica and Yuri, and it's later revealed that Natsuki is upset by this because she is not welcome to share her manga elsewhere. She is used to having to defend her interests and her self-expression against her father and her other friend groups who try to pressure her into growing out of it, and so reflexively exercises those defenses when she feels that the literature club is not accommodating her either. Again, something I relate to, as I have many times felt like I had to to defend my interests, and by extension myself, in the face of my parents, especially my mother, refusing to acknowledge those interests as legitimate. Monica only rejects Natsuki's manga at first because it didn't fit in with her plan for the literature club. Monica likes to feel in control feel as if she has everything together, and has the solution to every problem. She prefers that she makes a plan for a thing, and it works out as she planned it. When she feels not in control, like she can't fix things, can't make things go her way, she struggles with handling the situation in a mature fashion, a flaw that she exhibits and comes to terms with all throughout the side stories, and also, throughout the main game. Today I cut my skin open for the first time. It was exhilarating. I think I understand how it feels now. I'm supposed to be the responsible one, though. So I don't think I'll be doing it again. Unless I decide to kill myself. I left a memento of the occasion below. So, that being said, Joyce, I have a confession to make. I'm in love with you. You are truly the light in my world. When there's nothing else in this game for me, you're here to make me smile. Will you make me smile like this every day from now on? Joyce, will you go out with me? So, here we have a woman who is so desperate for any sort of human contact that she will ask this person she doesn't even know, can't meet, can't touch, can't even see, to please, please love her forever. And that, I think we can agree, is just pretty sad. This is, of course, a work of fiction, and your engagement with it is wholly consensual, and can be broken off at any time by simply quitting the game, but if we for a moment believe for the sake of arguments that this is real, then Monica is being a Abusive. She is abusing the player's presumed motivations for playing, i.e. to get a cute anime girlfriend, to try and win you over. She is exhibiting a toxic codependency, casually talking about how depressed she is, as her life has become more empty and meaningless, how she was going to kill herself if she couldn't have you, how you are all she has left in this world. She is making you the monster here, if you reject her. If someone you're dating says stuff like this in real life, the generally practical advice is to run the fuck away from them, because that is an abusive relationship. Well, that's easy enough for me to say. But, you know, I get it. She doesn't want to be lonely. She's just taking what she sees as the last chance she has at a real human connection, or anything approximating one, in a world that she feels has denied her that. A world that doesn't exist, that never existed and never will exist, that will never give her a real life, a future with you, or anyone else. And, well, I too am... Um, Living in a world without a future, 
searching for a happy end. Pen in hand, I find my strength. The courage endowed upon me by my one and only love. Together, let us dismantle this crumbling world and write a novel of our own fantasies. With a flick of her pen, the lost finds her way. In a world of infinite choices, behold this special day. After all, not all good times must come to an end. The first time I made this video, I talked about how there are two ending paths of sorts here, as the player is given the choice to show empathy for Monica by staying with her, or else deleting her. And that's true, you certainly are given that choice, but I neglected to address what that choice says, what it says about Monica, and more importantly, about the person making that choice. If someone chooses to delete Monica, well, it's possible that they actively hate her. It's also possible that they simply want to progress the story. Or perhaps they loved Monica, but have decided they must finally let her go. But if someone sits and listens to Monica, well, perhaps they want to read her additional dialogue. And, you know, sure. I wanted to read her additional dialogue, I still do, but there's also another possibility, one that is far from hypothetical. Early on in the game's release, a bug was discovered in Act 3 that caused the game to enter a crash loop, thus forcing the player to delete Monica to progress. Salvato patched the bug, but before doing so received an email from a player who had refused to delete Monica, but because of this bug, had to emotionally accept the inevitability of it and let her go. They begged Salvato not to fix the bug, because ultimately it had made their experience more positive, and they felt the game would be better for it. This player was not alone in their reluctance to delete Monica. Numerous Steam reviews bring up how Monica is the first and only girl to show interest in them, with one of the highest rated reviews of Plus reading simply, I have not felt the touch of a woman in four years. There's a few posts on the Steam forums from players talking about how they didn't want to leave her alone. While we have no good way of measuring statistics for this, I think it's a pretty safe bet that the people who feel strongly about not deleting Monica, or who install Afterstory and run it in the background, lead some pretty sad love lives. And I don't say that to suggest I'm better than them or anything like that, because I'm not. I ran after story in the background once too. I, too, lead a pretty sad love life. I am very much the sort of person who would feel bad about deleting Monica, and I did indeed feel bad about deleting Monica. And I am very much the sort of person who can relate to Monica, because I am, myself, very much like Monica and the other DDLC girls. Sometimes, I'm as depressed as Sayori. Sometimes, I'm as shy and scared as Yuri. Sometimes, I'm as aggressive and blunt as Natsuki. Sometimes, I'm as inflexible and manipulative as Monica. And from time to time, I am a horrible, difficult, frightening cocktail of all of those things at once. And more. <laughs> Very recently, I found myself slipping into a toxic pattern of codependency similar to that of Monica for very similar reasons. I was happily dating six girlfriends in an online polycule for many months, until I took the polycule offline just this June, the same month DDLC Plus was set to launch, in fact, and then I wasn't. Things didn't go according to plan, at least not to my plan, not to my expectations. They didn't care for me the way I'd wanted them to, and I couldn't accept that. And then they didn't want me there, and I was scared. And then I reacted, desperately, trying to fix things, trying to pull them back to me, and I couldn't. And if I hadn't 
done at least one of those things, then perhaps that breakup wouldn't have happened. If I hadn't been so insecure, so difficult, so needy, so much of a goddamn perfectionist, it would have gone differently. I wouldn't have pushed them away. One of those girls took pity on me, told me that she cared about me, that she truly regretted how things had gone and hoped I'd improve, and continued talking to me for about a month after we'd broken up, but I pushed her away, too. I told her that I felt like the breakup marked the loss of what was quite possibly the last chance I would ever have at filling the hole that had been in my life all this time, that I was afraid I'd never get another chance, that I wouldn't live long enough, and even if I did, those same flaws that had pushed them away would just push everyone else away as well. After all this time of trying to change and feeling like I'd failed to change meaningfully, because I've just kept on losing people, just the same as before, I've come to fear that I can't change, that my mental illness and character flaws are just an intractable part of my personality, and that all I can do is accept them, hope other people will accept me for how fucked up I am, and that I won't need to change, that there won't be a chance of change before I die to the world burning down around me, or else to one of the many, many, many things in this awful, violent, godless, uncaring, capitalist hell world that could kill me. Fearing that my only option for any shred of lasting happiness in life was to try and find the best available people to live with and love me, and survive what little life I had left with them. and. This girl, this beautiful, kind, patient, sensitive, intelligent girl who had once told me she loved me, that I was an extremely caring and loving person who she wanted to live with, who she wanted to help keep safe, told me that she no longer cared about me, that I, she no longer held any hope for me, told me I was being manipulative, that I'd learned nothing, and then she soft blocked me on all the social media places. Part of how this happened was uh, that I was indeed an emotionally manipulative trash fire bitch, but I think another part of it was perhaps that my bar was very low and their bar presumably was also pretty low, until they realized just how low I was. Or else I was very good at convincing them I was better than that, or maybe they were just simping me because they liked my YouTube videos. And considering they weren't exactly desperate for me or anything, of course. Of course they cut me out. Of course they throw me away. Of course they wouldn't care if they really were my last chance at escaping loneliness. And of course, of course. They'd delete Monica. Doki Doki Literature Club is easy, too easy, to pin as nihilistic edgelord trash with a tragic story for the sake of being tragic. I can see how one would come to that conclusion, but with all due respect to the person who believes that and disagrees with everything I have thus far said and am about to say, I don't agree, and I think it's kind of a boring conclusion to end an analysis at. It's just not interesting. There's of course the more upbeat alternate ending, but also, I still view DDLC as a story about empathy, a story that invites you to empathize with its characters on some level, even when they are their worst possible selves. A game that in both endings thanks you for playing it and for having been there for these girls, that tells you that your time with them mattered. Still, in my original video, I talked about the 
the finality of the original game, the way it's given meaning by being so small, so limited, and the ending precluding any possible future for these characters. How it's a cosmic horror, not because it's so great and overwhelming as to make us feel meaningless, but rather because the characters gaze through the screen into our world and see the meaningless of their existence reflected back at them. The way the story ends with Monica saying there is no happiness in the literature club, no chance for them to grow, to get better, to live. I remember crying when I first played DDLC. Monica sang, while the sun rose behind me, flowing into the windows all around me, and I, I felt recognized. I felt like my own loneliness, my own struggles in life, had been recognized by Monica. I connected with her song, and I felt like I felt her pain. I've had about three and a half years to think about this. Three and a half years in which I have been transitioning and changing and living, but yet I've not changed all that much at all. And I think the answer to why I connected with this game then is the same as why I connect with it now. It's because I felt the pain of these characters, who felt that they did not matter to a world that does not care about them, who were afraid of losing everyone around them, who were afraid of losing me. It's really, really, really easy when you have a critical personality flaw that keeps pushing people away from you, making them not want to be around you, to assume that that flaw is just a part of you, that you have to just own that, live with that. You decide that it's an inevitability, that you'll fuck up, that it's just an... it's just an... just an inescapable part of your identity and your personality. You start to give up on not fucking up, instead hoping that one day, one way or another, eventually you won't need to confront your problems when someone finally chooses to accept and love fucked up you. I've been that person. I still am that person. Sayori, Natsuki, Yuri, and Monica are all that person, and I don't find it difficult to imagine that sometimes I've looked like Yuri's act to self to some people when I've fucked up badly enough. But while I didn't change all that much, Doki Doki Literature Club, surprisingly, seems to have changed quite a fair bit. The message of the game I don't think changed too much, but the pronunciation did. and. It feels so much clearer in retrospect that this story is even less hopeless than I thought. It was always telling me this, I just didn't fully see it back then. I... <laughs> I lied a bit about the Metaverse Enterprise team's motivation earlier. Well, it was broadly true. The goal of the company is certainly to make money selling to clients, and the stated goal of the creators of VM1 is to try and save their jobs, but as you read their files and emails further, it becomes clearer and clearer that this is for them a passion project. They talk about how they don't want others at the company to ask questions, how they need to try and make DDLC something they can pitch to their superiors as being profitable, even as their work is, in the end, serving the machine they live and work under, a machine larger and bigger than any one of them. They are all on this project for a reason, and that reason is to prove their existence. They seem to suspect that they too are living in a simulation, and they are studying the small-scale simulation of DDLC while working on bigger and more complex simulations in an effort to gain a better understanding of their own world. There's one particularly touching message shared between the Metaverse team, specifically the in-universe DDLC creator Paula Milner and fellow engineer Eve Laster, which I think I'm just going to have to let you see the entirety of it, because it says so much to me about this game and about these people. Dearest Eve, where are the years going? Doesn't it feel like ever since we graduated, we're just the same doofy college kids, but we're being put into increasingly adult situations? 
It's hard to believe how much can happen in just one year, but all of my memories this year are full of reminders why you've been my very best friend for so long. My gratitude for you is higher reaching than the mountains I'm gonna live in after faking my death. <laughs> Throwback to you actually entertaining that plan after helping me break up with Daphne. To this day, I can never tell how serious or joking you are about things, or life in general, but I think I would literally implode if I didn't have you to remind me that things never matter as much as they seem in the moment, and that things will always be okay. Imagine if we really do end up working together at Metaverse. That's literally the only way I think I'd be capable of coping with a mundane desk job. I know you said that your referral of me won't go very far, because you're not a senior engineer, but as I'm coming out of my rough patch, it's the future I imagine for myself every day. I'm sorry for always being such a bundle of stress. I always feel like I want to be doing more for you, because the amount you do for me just seems like more than anything I could give back. You inspire me to always improve, and when I don't believe in myself, I stay motivated to become a better person so that I can deliver all of my best qualities to you. I love you, and I always will, until we face the end of the world together. Wishing for another 14 million years of friendship. With everlasting love, Paula. This made me tear up. Not just because of the implication that Monica was based on Paula, but because of how clearly and eloquently I felt it encapsulates Doki Doki Literature Club's true meaning. A meaning reinforced not just by the main game, but by the side stories as well. In the second to last side story, Yuri and Natsuki have an argument over their mutual disdain for each other's interests, neither feeling like the other is taking them seriously, both instinctively feeling a need to defend themselves and to justify why they love what they do. Despite Monica's best efforts to mediate, the confrontation escalates, leaving Yuri and Natsuki feeling deep animosity between each other, despite both wanting to get along, but both feeling like they can't. Natsuki and Yuri's conflict is probably one of the most real things to me in the entire game because I've lived through that. When you're neurodivergent or queer or otherwise marginalized, you tend to feel as if you're the only person like you in the world and you belong nowhere and no one will ever be your friend. Which, when you discover that you're quite wrong and that there are other people like you, leads you to hope that finally you'll get along with everyone, that all your issues socializing with others won't matter in a space where everyone is deviant in the same ways you are. But it never quite works that way. In some ways I've found it's easier for sure, but in other ways it's often even harder to get along with people who are similar to you because, well, you're still messed up. Natsuki and Yuri both have their issues, they have their own ways of dealing with them, and those coping mechanisms are incompatible, leading only to a feedback loop in which they continuously hurt each other while trying to protect themselves from hurt. I have been through that far too many times, and it's always painful, knowing that you could have been the best of friends, but having to stay far, far apart, knowing no good can ever come of your interacting ever again. And I don't have a solution. All four of the Literature Club girls are pretty awful at conflict resolution, tending to run away from their problems until they can't anymore, and I'm no different. Sayori and Monica 
independently counsel both Natsuki and Yuri, while both echo similar sentiments about how they are ashamed of their behavior and their feelings over one another, neither wanting to interact with the other for fear of making everything worse. And it's in one of those two exchanges that I think Sayori says what turns out to be perhaps the most important thing in the entire game. My feelings make me a bad person. Because my feelings just want to tell me that I'm so much better than her. That she's a judgmental know-it-all who's stuck in her edgy phase, and I'm just way above that garbage. But I'm terrible for feeling that way. You're not terrible. You are not your feelings. But... You are not your feelings! Say that to yourself. Out loud. Fine. I... I am not my feelings. She goes on to describe feelings like a roommate, something that you have to live with to try and understand and compromise with, rather than something that defines you. The girls we saw in Act 2 of the game, the versions of themselves they feared becoming, those feelings weren't them. It was their actions that were them, their choice to let their feelings command them. You are not your feelings. You live with your feelings, and you choose which feelings you listen to. Just as Monica defined her epiphany, chose how she felt about her epiphany, and that knowing that, remembering that, was what I needed, wasn't it? In the end, that was what Natsuki and Yuri needed. Yesterday you told me something that I'm thinking about a lot. What was that? The thing about how feelings aren't right or wrong, and that they're just a state of being we need to come to terms with. It made me think about how a person's behavior isn't always just how they decide to be. It's also made up of their past experiences and their insecurities. I think that helps me see other people as actual people, rather than as insignificant side characters who are out to get me somehow. Is that how you felt about Natsuki? And this culminates in my favorite side story in the game, self-love. After Yuri writes a letter to Natsuki to reconcile, they meet at a deserted set of stairs next to a vending machine. It becomes their special spot, where they come every day and just talk to each other. Not about how they can get along better, or any of the issues they have with each other, they just start getting along, knowing that both girls mean well without needing to establish an understanding that this is the case. And they find they have a lot more in common than they thought, and the end is so beautiful, touching, and lovely, they both help each other improve and grow and understand themselves and one another better, and the conclusion is so nice and sweet and gay all of a sudden. <laughs> also, in this side story, Natsuki reveals that she used to write fanfiction. She's embarrassed by it now, but she's glad that she changed and that she became a better person after her edgy phase, and look, all I'm saying is this is a trans girl. This is a beautiful, good, lovely trans girl who wrote some shitty fanfiction about lesbians and then turned into a lesbian. You cannot tell me otherwise. DDLC side stories, to complement a story of pain and hopelessness and isolation, are about overcoming those anxieties that all these girls live with and becoming better than them. But what really gets me about all this is that the girls decide to improve despite themselves. They decide to get better. Nothing made them, they just did. And yeah, sure, it's because they don't know that they're living in a simulation, but no one does! And like, that doesn't really matter that they don't know, or if we'd be happier in some hypothetical alternate reality where we didn't know how dire things were for our world because we do know it, and we know that they got better, so why couldn't we? The Metaverse VM1 team knows that they might be living in a simulation, in a world that's possibly soon to end, and Paula, still, is committed to getting better. Paula 
isn't letting people who have worse personalities than her make her life worse, even if she might be able to empathize with those people. So she cuts Daphne out of her life, fakes her death and disappears. She's just living in the way she needs to live to be happy, choosing to love the people who matter to her. And I think that in this, DDLC Plus says something that I find really poignant and beautiful. Even though these characters live in a simulation, they have no future, their lives still matter. They still matter. And that's just what my ex was trying to tell me. It only came to me now. I only decided to believe it now, after she cut me off forever a month later, after I had no choice but to not let myself be weighed down by her. I stalled on this video for that month because I was, at the time, finding it difficult to believe what I saw in DLC Plus, that I mattered, that even if I don't have a future, or I'll be dead, or I'm not real, or whatever, I do matter, and I do have a life worth living while it lasts. And I realized as I began to write this script, that I was just so stupidly wound up over some girl that I wasn't letting myself see that. And to that girl, if she's watching this, I say, I am genuinely thankful to you for breaking it off like you did. For forcing me to finally decide whether or not to believe what you told me. Because if you hadn't done that, given me the shot in the arm that made me want to believe what I needed to believe to get to the place where I could make this video, I'd still be pathetically clinging to you and hurting the both of us. I don't know for sure if I'm lying to myself again or not. I don't know if I'll ever get better. I don't know if I'll ever be worth your love, and I know I'll probably never see you again. You owe me nothing after all you did for me, but, but I don't need you. I don't need to face the end of the world with you. I will face it myself, and I will be as happy as I can. Make as many of my hopes as real as I can, with whoever is willing to survive alongside me. Even if none of what I hope for in my life comes to pass, it will have all been worth it in the end, because... because I will have lived. That girl, that... that wonderful and gentle girl whose patience I tried so much, who put up with my horrible personality for so long despite everything, left me a note the day before I was to disappear outside of my hotel room door, I read simply, You are Joyce Fisher. That much is certain. And I cried again. I knew what it meant, but I wasn't willing to believe it. I hope I believe it now. Even as I delete Monica, as I know I can never be hers as she wants of me, I know it's just what has to happen and that I don't hate her. It's just me making the best decision I possibly can for us because it's an infeasible relationship and she cannot escape, cannot change. But what I said in my original video is still true. I'm not Monica. I'm not static, I'm not code, I'm not the product of a script or a simulation, and even if I am, it doesn't really matter. The fact that I believe I can change means that I can. The fact that this Monica and the Literature Club believed they could change means they can. It means you can. And that means you're worthy of love and loving. And that also means your heart will be broken, and that you'll have to break a few hearts yourself along the way. And sometimes that means you'll be alone in a world of infinite choices, the most terrifying place to be. 
that I've ever been in. But as long as you persevere and get better, you'll never be lonely forever. If I can hear the sound of your heartbeat, what do you call love in your reality? And in your reality, if I don't know how to love you, I'll leave you be. I would like to take a moment to thank all of my patrons, especially Ava, Eli Berg-Moss, Cassandra, Quakeful Tales, Athiat, Awu, Bri, Hikari no Yume, Sven Lupov, Tis, and as always, I'd also like to thank everybody who's put up with me for this long and helped me get this far. And I would especially sincerely like to thank everybody who couldn't put up with me anymore but helped me nevertheless. I hope all of you are doing very well, and I wish the best to all of you. Thank you, and goodbye.